Welcome to this week's edition of Doug Out Dish Podcast. I'm Andy Kirikides, joined by my wonderful co-host, Keith Glasser. Keith, how we doing? Great. How are you? Good. Today, we are going to talk about decommitment and the process of de- being decommitted. Um, unfortunately, there's been a rash of this recently, much which has to do with the anticipated and I believe now formalized roster constraints that will be uh, put in play for next fall. So quick refresher. Uh, Recently, uh, House versus NCAA, go look it up if you want to get more, listen to our previous podcast about it. Um, But essentially what's happening is Division I rosters are going to go from 40 to 34. Uh, So somehow, some way, coaches have to Uh, find ways to get their rosters down to 34 for next fall. Um, Transfer portal needs to be taken into consideration. Graduating players will be taken into consideration. But ultimately, some of this fallback is going to happen with high school guys, and we're seeing it all across Twitter. Probably a little bit more than usual. I would say definitely more than usual. Um, But it's a real thing that's happening right now, and you know there may be families listening that are – subject to exactly what we're talking about. So we're going to take a few minutes to talk about if you get decommitted, what do you need to do? What are some things you need to start thinking about? What are some things that you need to consider going through this process? Additionally, we'll talk in detail about the 2026 class. And there's a lot of guys who've committed already and what they need to do and what they need to be aware of as they go through this process, because it would be naive to think that you couldn't be one of those guys that come time, come this time next year, because contrary to common belief, this is not a new occurrence. This is something that's been happening for a long time. It gets a lot more publicity now because of social media and kids post about it. Um, But the reality is due to the roster change, we're seeing more of it right now. And I think it's important for uh, us to talk about this topic and have some conversation around what families can be doing or should be doing if uh, they do find themselves in a situation where they have to uh, look for another school. So I'll pass it over to you, coach. Where do you want to start with this one? Um, Yeah, we can start with the, um, you know, kind of what to do, I I, I suppose in the, the initial, the initial couple days of hours, days of, um, the old decommitted, you know, you're seeing, uh, this always happens, right? This, this has been going on for a, a number of years where it gets too close to signing period. And it's usually around now, um, Jupiter and, and some other things where coaches kind of get a final look at guys and decide whether or not they think that they've made enough strides over the course of the last 12 months, 24 months, 36 months in some cases that they are going to be worthy of being on a roster given where they see them at the end of next year, their senior year of high school, and then into the the freshman fall. <clears throat> you know, the reality is you're not playing a college baseball game. If you're a senior right now, you're not playing a college baseball game for another 18, no, 60, 14, 16 months. Um, somewhere in there, my math's a little off, but uh, you know, you still got your entire senior year plus the fall, you know, so October gets you a year, November, December, January, February, yeah, 16 months. Um, you know, so it, it, it's, there's a long time and coaches are trying to project that stuff out. You have the roster crunch that's coming where, you know, it's going to be at the very, at the very most, it's going to be at their very least, let's say it's going to be at 34. Um, There are some rumblings that it might be a little bit higher in the fall, but, you know, that could be with kids who are going to be redshirted and and things of that nature. But there's going to be a hard cap and that hard cap is likely not going over 30 or not going over 40. Excuse me. So, you know, I wouldn't be shocked if it comes out and they're, they, they do have 40, but there's, there's latitude to do some, some red shirting in there. Guys who maybe had Tommy John or, you know, guys who maybe had some knee injuries or something like that, where they're not able to actually play and they're done for the year and they can still be on the roster and be able to do things. Now there's other questions in there and I digress for a second as to whether or not they can be on scholarship and all the other stuff, but that's neither here nor there for this conversation. Um, you know, but when you initially get decommitted, it, you know, there's probably that initial shock of like, oh, my goodness, what just happened? I, you know, have spent the last 
couple of years, not even entertaining any other um, offers or talking to coaches and telling people that I am decommitted, you know, so you, you start to kind of figure out like, what do I need to do in order to be able to get in, you know, in touch with other coaches? Because right now the quiet period started on Monday. We are currently recru- recording on October 15th. The quiet period started yesterday on October 14th. So coaches cannot go off campus and see you play anywhere. So, you know, you're likely going to want to go through your Rolodex of coaches that had reached out to you prior to you committing, maybe some coaches who had reached out to you after you were committed, but maybe didn't know that you were committed um, and kind of see where they're at, see what kind of camps they have coming up. There are a multitude of camps that are going to be coming um, in the next couple of weeks as uh, coaches are and, and programs are trying to uh, kind of scramble to, to get some guys on campus over the course of the next couple of weeks because either A, they've had some decommits or B, they weren't able to kind of get out and see guys. And, you know, with, you know, last week, the hurricane in Florida, where there's a lot of uh, games being played, everything got washed. And now they're playing this week. Coaches cannot go out and see players. So it's an opportunity to be able to kind of get out there over the course of the next couple of weekends in October and November and try to get to some camps and get seen by some of those coaches and, and potentially be able to get some, um, some feedback there and, and maybe find a roster spot. The other is try to find a place where, you know, you're going to fit in academically. You know, you might have to level down to division two or division three and kind of see where they're at or reach out to other schools that you might not have, you know, really entertained or never heard of from, but Hey, it's a division one school. And, you know, maybe they're still looking for guys and just start pounding the pavement and getting emails out and seeing where programs are at with guys to see if you can potentially work your way up their board because, you know, the leg, everyone knew this was coming just so everyone knows everyone knew this was coming. So uh, I have a sneaking suspicion in talking to people that there were roster spots that were being held for this exact reason that guys were going to be decommitted. They wanted to be able to have roster spots available to be able to maybe scoop up some of these guys either from a decommit standpoint or from the transfer portal next year. So there's roster spots available everywhere. It's just really being able to find the right fit from a program, a coach, and a school standpoint so that you feel comfortable in making that decision and being able to play college baseball somewhere. Yeah, you don't have a ton of time to sit around and feel bad about it, right? And I understand that, you know, if you're a kid or a family who's in this situation and you had a coach call you and say, hey, man, we don't don't, don't have for you anymore. Um, Yeah, that sucks. Um, And it doesn't mean that you don't feel the the emotion that's involved with that you know you you feel like you had an opportunity uh and it got taken away from you like yeah i get it but if your goal is to play college baseball you don't have a ton of runway to figure it out so you need to get after it to your point anybody who's reached out to you in the past email message them on twitter um you're never going to find out where they stand with their recruiting class or if there's still interest there if you don't ask Um, And then going back to exactly what you said, like you need to come up with another list, another list of contingencies. What's, what are some schools that have an academic fit for you? Reach out to them, division twos, division threes. Um, The line of of level of play is certainly continuing to get blurred um, specifically between the lower level of division one, division two and division three. There's, there's just so many programs that are very similar in terms of the talent. Um, that is required to play at those different places. So don't get caught up in the division. If college baseball is really your goal, uh, this is the this is a time where you have to put away the bumper sticker and worrying about that. And you need to really focus on where can I find a place where I can go and, and compete for a spot and, and get an opportunity to play college baseball. The other thing I think is important, you know, I, th- I think that this, we've talked about this a little bit, but how you interact with coaches when you go through the recruiting process is really important because if you had really good interactions with the coach and you told them no in a very respectful way, you made a phone call, um, you thanked that coach for their time and effort, you made a connection with that coach, those, those openings may be there because you had a really positive interaction with a coach. If you're someone who goes to the coach, never responded to an email, never responded to a phone call, uh, text message the coach to tell him that you weren't coming to school, shot him an email to tell him that you weren't coming to school. You probably aren't putting yourself in a very advantageous position in terms of how you move forward with this kind of stuff. So um, something to keep in mind for 
for future classes and just how you interact with people, being respectful of how you communicate with them, uh, responding to those emails, even if you don't have a ton of interest, goes a long way. I mean, even if you respond to tell them no, like, hey, coach, right now I'm looking at some other schools. Thank you for your interest. Um, that's way better than you're the kid who never responded to them, and now you're calling in a panic because you don't have a place to play. Um, so be mindful of of that kind of retrospectively um, and probably more advice for, for kids moving forward. But how you interact with people is really important. Um, but you got to get after it. Like you need to be on social media. You need to be following coaches. You need to converse with people who can help you get through this process, uh, whether it's your travel coaches, your high school coaches, um, someone like us who helps families navigate this process. You need to you need to sit down. You need to get a lay of the land and you need to get a lot of lines in the water to give yourself the best opportunity of catching something. Um, and I think it's, I don't want to call that simple, but if you sit back and you play the woe is me game and you think that a bunch of dudes are just going to come and all of a sudden recruit you because you posted about how much you appreciate the previous coach and staff, but you no longer have a spot on that roster. Like, yeah, for some kids, if you got decommitted from Texas, like, yeah, I'm sure that kid's market is pretty good. He's probably going to be able to find a place because if you're good enough to commit to Texas, you're probably good enough for a lot of programs. But if you're committed to a lower end Division One school that ends up, you might not be as marketable. So you need to get out there and you need to make sure that you're communicating with these coaches. Your idea of there's a ton of college camps that are going to be coming up this month and into November. Yeah, go. Your off-season plans may have changed a little bit. Um, but if you're not willing to pivot, if you're not willing to put yourself out there, it's going to be tough um, because there's a lot of kids who will. And you got to get your hat back in the ring. You got to get back on the the proverbial horse, if you will, um, and and get in the mix and and do everything you can to get your name back out there and search for a place that's going to meet your needs from an academic and a baseball perspective. Yeah. I think the other part too, you know, is you need to have all, all options on the table, you know, from a division one standpoint, a division two standpoint, division three. I mean, we've talked about this ad nauseum on here, but you know, there's really good baseball being played at the division two and division three level too. Um, you know, the, the ability to be able to, to say that you, you know, you can swallow your pride a little bit and go down and play, you know, that, that, that's not the worst idea in the world. And, and the, the elephant in the room that we haven't discussed yet either is, is keeping the JUCO option on the table too. You know, junior college baseball is, is really good all over this country, you know, and you can find programs and they're always willing to take a lot of guys and JUCO baseball is, you know, it, it's great, especially for younger players, because you, there are no rules, really. Like, you can practice the entire fall semester. You can play, I, th I believe it's 14 games in the fall. And a lot of schools take advantage of playing that many games. And then you can play up to, I think, 54 or 56 in the spring. You know, you're, you're going to play a lot of baseball. And there's something to be said about, you know, uh, and there's there's a reason why a lot of the the higher end schools and and there are division twos, ones, twos, and threes that that will recruit JUCO players because you can get guys that are juniors in high school or ju excuse me, juniors in college that have a lot more college experience under their belt than the juniors that might be in your program who haven't played for a year or two or have played limited time and they only have 30 at bats in two years. And you get a JUCO guy who, you know, he could have 600 at bats under his belt at the college level by the time he gets to your program you know there's a lot of guys out there that would look at that and be like 600 at bats and he hit 320 and a guy who has 30 at bats and hit 150 like you know with this kid is likely going to elevate our program so you know the juco option juco option still has to stay on the table if it's something where you do get decommitted you know reach out to some jucos and see hey where where are you at in the recruiting process? This just happened, you know, and the beauty with JUCO too, you know, we talk about how much you can practice and you can play and do all these things and develop, you know, the flip side to that is you don't have to stay for two years. You can transfer out after your freshman year. Like you could go and have a, like, you can have a lights out year and be really, really good and be recruitable and go sign somewhere else after your freshman year and go to a four-year school for three years. You certainly can stay 
for two years and after you get your associates. Because at the end of the day, when you graduate, it doesn't say like there's no asterisk that says like JUCO for two years and two years here. Like your diploma still says that you graduated from that school. You know, so there's that that JUCO option is is still on the table if if, if it is something that unfortunately does happen um, to you. Like, hey, go ahead and you know beat down some doors and see what you know if JUCO baseball might be for you. And it it could be maybe a, a lower tier Division One school or a Division Two or a Division Three, whatever it might be. But you know, you, you got to be able to have all options on the table and be able to be willing to go to places that you find are a fit for you. And the program finds that you are a fit for them. And it's going to take a little bit more extra like work. And it's probably going to be daunting because you haven't had to do this like a lot of other people because you've probably been committed for a while. But we're, you're in this now. So this is, here's a plan. Let's start beating down doors and seeing where I might be able to find a spot. You know, so I, I think that there's, there, there's a lot of things that, that can be done and, and need to be done. But you know, it can seem a little daunting at, at first. And, you know, this is kind of a little bit of a roadmap for what you should do if that does happen to you. And it, I'm glad you brought up the JUCO thing because if you're going through this process right now and you're not looking at junior colleges, I, I think you're really selling yourself short um, for a, a list of reasons. But coaches actively recruit junior college baseball. Um you know, spoke to a coach down in Texas um, the other day, and we're talking a, a Saturday game in September, and there was 15 or 16 Division One schools from all over the country that flew down to watch that game. That is not abnormal, um, and it's to exactly your point. You're getting bigger, stronger, more mature young men that have played a lot more baseball, they're better equipped to come into a program and make an impact. And it's really just an extension of the transfer portal, or I should say the transfer portal at this point, because junior college baseball has been around so long is transfer portal is really extension of junior college baseball at this point. It's a, it's a way for coaches to go find players that have experience and can have more of an immediate impact on their program. And you're selling yourself short if you're not looking at those types of schools and, you know, the common pushback we get on this is, well, I'm a really good student. Like, why would I look at junior college? I don't think that really applies for exactly your point, which is you're going to be judged on your four-year degree, not your two-year degree. So if you go and knock it out of the park, if you're a really good student in high school, you go and knock it out of the park at junior college and you don't take basket weaving and, and you know, pottery classes and you go in and you take real courses that are going to transfer in you can still go to a super high academic school for your junior and senior year. Like that is not, that is not an outlier. It just really means that you just need to kind of lock in from an academic perspective when you get there and be smart about what you schedule and what you take um, and continue to excel. But I mean, there's the Ivy league programs that have junior college players on them. Uh, there's not a lot of them, but there are. And there's a lot of high academic schools that have the ability to go and get junior college players if those junior college players are holding up their end of the bargain in in the in the classroom. So that classic fallback argument of like, well, junior college is that's where you go if you're not a really good student. No, not at all. Um, I don't think that that really applies anymore. And the quality of baseball that's being played at that level is extremely high end. And it's an opportunity for you to play. It's an opportunity for you to get better. And you give yourself at least two more years to be recruited and your back's against the wall right now. That's the reality of it. And to not use every tool you have at your disposal, I think would be, uh, would be naive. And some people may need to swallow their pride a little bit on this around the division, as well as potentially junior college baseball and start to look um, beyond how cool that Twitter post is going to look and really, really get down to the heart of it, which is, are you going to a place where the coach and staff is the right fit? Are you going to get a chance to play? Are you going to be a part of a good program and really focus in on that stuff and less about, you know, the name brand uh, that you get to put out there? Yeah. The, you know, there, the, I think that there's, 
it, it, it's you're essentially restarting the recruitment process and it's uber late now that being said it's also not necessarily as late as you think it is because as i alluded to before you know i i do think that there are a decent amount of programs out there that have anticipated this and have kind of kept roster spots open in anticipation of something like this happening so they you know some coaches are are kind of waiting for this fallout you know and and the reality is you know early decision at schools is still like no, like november 1st or mid november the regular decision usually is until january 1 or mid january and most schools kick the can down the road until february to try to get more apps in you know so you're not from a from a, a straight up admission standpoint getting to colleges like you're not that late your your clock is really ticking from a baseball standpoint which is why you know you kind of got to turn the page relatively quickly and start to try to figure out what schools might be a fit for you in, in, in the coming weeks because you know from a, a school and admission standpoint you know you're still looking at another you know eight weeks you know t- 10 to 12 weeks you know you still got another two and a half three months before apps have to be in and, and things like that and to be completely honest but if you're getting recruited you're going to have a really good idea from the the coaching staff whether or not you're going to be admissible because they're going to want to make sure you're admissible before they get down the road with you recruiting wise. So you're going to have a pretty good idea as to whether or not you're getting into that school. It really just becomes a, a, a time crunch from what type of school you eventually would like to end up at slash do get recruited by. And, you know, if you have, you know, and I will say this, you know, if you are, you know, if you were committed to a division one school and got decommitted, that doesn't necessarily automatically put you into the mix at other division one schools. It could be because you haven't progressed further, far enough along and you're not at that caliber of player that they need. So you might have to go down to division two or three or a Juco and go play. And I'm not saying Juco again, because of the talent level, just because it's a, it's a third option that you can throw out there. You know, NAIA baseball too. Like we haven't necessarily touched on that, but like th- those are options as well in this process, depending on where you are geographically in this country. Um, you know, but I, I, it's it's really starting to formulate a plan, and I think that you know this is what we talk about a lot with with our clients and what we you know what we do. Like it's writing down a school list. What schools would I like to go to? What type of school would I like to go to? What part of the country am I willing to go to? You know, what, what is it that I'm looking for out of my college athlete, my college experience And you have to, you know, you probably have a good idea because you were committed somewhere and they checked a lot of boxes, take those same things that you worried about at the, on the front end and now apply them to what you're going to do now, find those schools and start reaching out to coaches and see where they're at in their process. I bet you that there's a decent amount that you reach out to that are like, yeah, no, we're, we still have a couple openings and, you know, let's, let's have a conversation and see where we go. You know, the flip side of this too, is like, this is just like the recruiting process where you might start hearing no from coaches like, Hey, our roster's full or Hey, like we're further down the law down the road with some guys. If anything falls through, like, we'll like, we'll certainly keep you in mind and let you know. Other times it might be like, Hey, like you got decommitted from X school. Like, yeah, man, like we've seen you thought you were really good. Like uh, it, you could catapult to the front of lists and that could mean that guys at the bottom of the list, like of that school might be looking for other places. Um, you know, but it, it, it's really the fortunes in the follow-up as my life, my wife likes to say, you know, you got to be able to reach out to these coaches and, and get, you know, have video readily available, make you, you know, have things on your Twitter or your Instagram that, you know, are updated to where you're at velo wise or swings or defense, whatever it might be. So that when you start reaching out, coaches can accept access this stuff to be able to take looks and and really make a determination relatively quickly as to whether or not you would be a fit athletically in their program. And then they can figure out the the personality and, and character fit after that. The fortune is in the follow-up. Brianna Glasser with just another gem. Shout out, BB. Uh, we're, we're gonna have to have her on the podcast one night yeah i think we should we do a wives edition i'm sure her and Allie both have good things to 
to in part. They've both been through it as high level division one athletes, um, slightly different perspective, but, uh, yeah, might have to make that happen. Coach class. I think it'd be great. Um, so for the 2025 class, I think to summarize is you got to get yourself out there. You got to have an open mind and yeah, you're going to hear no. And yeah, this sucks, but you got to start banging down doors. You got to start communicating with people and you got to put in the time and, and effort that's necessary to get back in the mix with some of these schools. So don't be shy about it. Get out there, put yourself out there. It's the only way you're going to end up getting where you want to go is to put your say, if you just sit back and hope that somebody calls you because you post it on Twitter, I think you're going to be in a tough spot. Um, yeah. And I think the other thing too, like to your point, you already just heard the worst no you could possibly hear. Yeah. Right. Like yeah, you were, you were committed and then you were told no. So it's not going to get any worse than that. If someone says no, Hey, I've already heard that before. That's fine. You know, but keep, you know, you got to keep grinding it out as much as I don't like using that statement. Uh, you know, you, you got to keep grinding it out so that you can, you know, hopefully find a spot that you're going to be able to fit in and, and find a lot of success, you know, and I, I'm not saying that I, I'm not advocating for this, but, you know, with, with the way college baseball is going and we've had multiple podcasts on this and we talk about it quite frequently, you know, the transfer portal is a real thing. Like it could be something in the future that you could potentially explore depending on where you, you land and how you progress and how you develop. You know, so that's, that's always something that can be, you know, accessible to you in your future career. Now, obviously, you have to do your part when you get to a school. You can't go in there and be like, oh, I was decommitted. I'm better than everyone and then not develop and not be good. And then you're just going to be there. Like you got to go in and, and show up and show out if you want to put yourself in that position later in your career. But, you know, there's, there's a lot of opportunities out there, not only from a four-year standpoint and a JUCO standpoint, you know, again, the, the, the portal is something that is, you know, a real live breathing thing right now. So, that is an option. And, and again, I'm not, I'm not advocating for it or saying that that should be a part of your thought process in doing this, but it is something that with the, the rules that are surrounding it, allow student athletes to be able to pursue that should they choose after a year or two or three or five or another pandemic seven. And we have a, a, a quarterback out there who I, I, is going to be granted like a ninth year or something. I, it's, it's it's getting to be a, a little bit ridiculous, if you ask me. But I digress. Different sport, different rules. But um, you know that uh, just something to keep in mind, right? Like if we if we're going to throw all cards on the table and you were decommitted and you're in this spot now, that is something that you know you should you know at least give a fleeting thought to it, it, with what you're doing. Um, and, you know, you never know, you could go to a, you could go to a program that, you know, you've, you'll find after getting decommitted and find that you love that place. And it could be a division two, II, division three school, and you're set for life and you love the academics and you love the team culture and you love the campus and you fall in love with that place. You don't want to leave like that. That is very much a, a very real possibility for, you know, 95% of kids that are going through this right now. Um, you know, and that's fine. That's awesome. Good on you. You know, but there, there, there is that that small possibility that you, you know, could enter the transfer portal and and go that route too. So again, I'm not, I'm not personally advocating for that being a, a, a huge determining factor in what it is that you're going to do when you go through this process. But if we are throwing everything on the table in in what essentially, hopefully, does not amount to pure panic, it's something that can be considered in that process as well. Correct. I mean, this this could be one of those things where it's a little bit of a blessing in disguise. I don't usually like to play that card, but it is one of those things. That, like, I mean, you throw it out there kind of how it is. Like, those coaches made a decision that you weren't a guy that they wanted in their program. So maybe it's a better thing that you get an opportunity here. I'll be at a last-minute, somewhat uh, uh, panic-filled decision, but it, it – it's the environment you're operating in and you need to face it down. I think that's really what it comes down to. Um, 
I want to take a couple minutes to talk about the 26 class too, because obviously the 25 class is the one that's bearing the brunt of it right now. Maybe this is like a little bit of a public service announcement. It's not a scare tactic, but this is going to happen again next year. And it's not going to happen because of roster sizes. It's going to happen because this is what happens every year. And if you're a 2026 and you're already committed, or you're a 2026 and you commit this spring, you need to hold up your end of the bargain. Because if you get passed by players, if you're that right-handed pitcher who's 88 to 91 right now and you found your dream school and you come out next spring and you're 86 to 89 because you didn't get after it this offseason or you didn't at least maintain what you do, maybe you put on a little bit of weight, maybe you're not moving quite as well. Well, there's the guy who is 84 to 86 who has an awesome offseason who's 89 to 92 now. Well, Coaches are going to go for the better guys. These guys have business decisions to make when it comes to recruiting classes and it comes to their programs. And you need to hold up your end of the bargain so you don't put yourself in a situation where a coach is making a call after you make a start in July and you struggle with command and they've seen you a couple of times and they just go, you know what? This kid's not where we thought he was going to be. We're going in a different direction. Um, it happens every year. It's being magnified right now. But for that 2026 class, this should be, this is kind of your warning, right? If you're committed right now and you think that you can just go through the motions this off season and you're good to go, like you will be painfully mistaken. There's a lot of kids who are working hard. There's a lot of kids who are going to get better and you need to at least hold court. Um, and the other piece is like, do the math. There's some programs out there right now. They've got six pitchers committed in their 2026 class those programs go in the portal like do the math you're not all going to be there you're not all going to show up on campus together and you have to take it on your own you have to take ownership of it of your process what you do the work you're putting in how you compete how you act how you treat coaches what are you doing in the classroom what are you doing off the field like you can't give these you can't give these schools a reason to move off of you as a recruit. Not saying that coaches are looking to do it. They don't want to do it. But the reality is, is if you put them in a situation where they figure out you're not a fit from a character perspective because you posted something stupid on, on X or Instagram, or you got in trouble at school, or you weren't holding up your end of the bargain academically, there's too many good players for these coaches to put up with that stuff. Like, yeah, there are circumstances where you are so good that you're going to get a really long rope, but there's very few of those guys around. And if you don't have some fire in your belly about trying to get better, um, you may find yourself in a tough situation come this time next year because you didn't hold up your end of the bargain. And uh, I mean, I could speak in nauseam about how important it is for guys to get after and continue to develop, but in today's day and age with the transfer portal, there's more leeway for coaches to make late decisions on their roster. And when push comes to shove, they're likely going to bet on either the guy that they think is better than you, even though you've already been committed, or they're going to bank on the fact that they can find a guy just like you in the transfer portal who isn't 17, who's been on a college campus, who knows how to operate in the college program. And there's far less of a learning curve for that kid to come and be impactful. Yeah. I, I think the other part of it too, <laughs> you nailed all of that. So, you know, but the, the other part of it is that with the N I L name, image and likeness and the revenue sharing and everything else, this is big business. And you need to understand that stepping into this realm is getting, it already was uber competitive. It is going to be even more competitive with roster crunches, with the money, with the name, image, and likeness stuff. All of like, there's, you're getting paid. Not everybody, right? But there's a lot of money at stake here. And there's a lot of things going on. And when you start involving a lot of money and all these things, business decisions are going to be made because at the end of the day, these coaches are going to be making a lot of money. 
and their livelihood is to go win baseball games, they need to make sure with a shortened down roster that they have the correct 34, 36, whatever number, but the 34 is the hard number, but they need to make sure that they have the correct 34 guys that are going to give them the best chance to win. And if you don't hold that up, hold up your end of the bargain, they can't take a chance on that because that could mean taking food off their table and not providing for their families. And it's hard to wrap your mind around as a 16, 17, 18 year old kid. That's a hard concept to kind of understand, but, and it, you know, there's going to be parents that are mad and, and everything else, but this is the world that you are stepping into. So if you want to go get an NIL deal and you want to go play division one college baseball and you want to make money, you need to do things that are going to be able to more or less justify why you are getting what it is you're getting. You need to be good academically. You need to be good athletically. You need to be good off the field. You need to do all of those things and check all those boxes. Because to your point, there are a lot of really good players out there. And I coach for a guy who all the time, his famous line would be, I've won with you. I'll win without you. I've also lost with you. I'll lose without you too. Plenty of good players out there who want to come play college baseball. I'll find them. And there's, there's a lot of truth in that. And I think that, you know, you need to understand that with, with all of this stuff that you're seeing, all these changes and the, the amount of scholarship money that is, you know, potentially going to be available at schools and NIL and revenue sharing and all that stuff, it's a completely different world than it was last year. It's a completely different world than it was five years ago. It is foreign. It's a foreign concept to you and I playing 20 years ago. It's, it, it, it's not even, it's inconceivable what this is, but you know, it, it doesn't necessarily mean that kids haven't been decommitted in this. Like it's been going on for years. It's the dirty secret. This has been going on for years. Kids have been dumped for as long as I can remember. But that said, there's more, there's more latitude for coaches. I keep using latitude tonight. There's more of that for coaches because they can just fall back on, well, hey, I, I need 34 of the best and you're not one of those guys. It's, it's an easy break from that standpoint, but it's likely going to be you didn't hold up your end of the bargain. You didn't get better athletically. You didn't get better in the classroom. You didn't get better off the field, whatever it might be. And they can't take that chance of now having 33 uh, of their 33, 30 of their 34, 30 of those guys are good. They can't have those four guys that are have to have their hands held and aren't good enough. It's it, it can't happen anymore. So if you're if you find yourself in that mix, you might find yourself being decommitted from that program and and going and having to go somewhere else. You know, and and are there going to be people who hold up their end of the bargain and it happens to? Yeah, it is, and that's unfortunate, and that's not what this is designed for. And I, I hate that for people. That's unfortunately the the nature of the beast at this time. And or, you know, the cost of doing business or whatever anecdote you want to throw out there. It's, it's just going to happen. But more likely than not, it's going to be because you haven't developed enough. You're not where you need to be physically. You're not where you need to be mentally. You're not there at classroom wise. It's, there's likely going to be boxes that you check that say, this kid's not going to be a good fit for us in the long term. I do think the, the slowing down of the contact rule and all that stuff is likely going to change that a little bit. But that said, you know, I, I, you could also argue the other way that it doesn't, that it gives like being able to contact kids earlier when they used to be able to gives you more leeway and, and lead time to be able to say like, yeah, this kid's going to be able to be a fit for us if we can, you know, if we get to the point where we want to offer them, you know, so you can go both ways on it. But, you know, at the end of the day, you're stepping into as close to a professional athlete experience that you are likely going to get. And you need to understand the the stakes and and the games that you're stepping into, and it could ultimately end with you being decommitted. It could end with you being cut after your freshman year, right? Like this this doesn't preclude anyone from when you get there that you might be because you could be the thirty fourth guy, and they could see it as like, well, he's never going to get better and play for us. Let's just move on now because we can, we have an out and bring other people in here who can who can help us get better. You know, so it's it's not just holding up your end of the bargain. Like you said beautifully, as a, a 2026 and and further on, but it it happens when you get there too. Like you have to continue to develop and do everything when you're actually on campus as a freshman, sophomore, junior, senior, in order to stay there for all four years. You have to be a part of the solution, whether you're a high school commit or you're current you're currently a kid on campus right now. Like you have to be a part of the solution, and at bare minimum, you have to be the right type of person 
in order to overcome some potential deficiencies on the baseball field. Like you can be number 34 on the roster if you're a freaking great teammate. Mm -hmm. But you can't be number 34 on the roster if you're a pain in the ass. Like you're going to be number 34 on the roster for one year. Yep. Right. And for high school kids, how you act may be the difference. Mm -hmm. Right. Because we just don't have time. Coaches just don't have time to hold your hand when you get to college. And, you know, if you're a 2026 command and I come to see you in the spring because I want to check in on you and the game time's lined up and I get to a game then you act like an asshole, you know, throwing your helmet or, you know, back talking umpires. Like that's a reason for me to go look at somebody else because I, to your point, we've said it a lot. There's no shortage of really talented baseball players and big fish, small pond. Like the reality is when you, when you take into account all the kids, I think there's 400 and, it's almost 500,000 high school baseball players across the country. It's not hard to find a good one. Nope. And if you want to, if you don't want to hold up your end of the bargain off the field, like that's the easiest out a coach can have. Hey man, you got in trouble doing dumb stuff. This is a consistent pattern. You're acting like a child on the field. Like that kind of stuff is a really good way to get, to, to get decommitted. Um, so like I said it's not a scare tactic, right? Like we're not here trying to scare people. That's not what. That's not why we do this. Um, but it is the truth, and sometimes the truth is, if you want to term it scary, sure, go ahead. If you want to term it hard, yeah, a lot of times the truth is is a little tough to hear. But this is still going to be a small percentage of kids. But do everything in your power to make sure you're not one of those kids. Some of that, some of that starts with making the right commitment. Yeah. And, well, I, th and I think the other thing too, not to cut you off, but I, I want you to continue your thought, but everyone, I, I want to accentuate this point. Like everyone thinks it's never going to happen to them until it does. And, you know, speaking from experience, it's not the best. You have to figure it out. But I, you know, I think that like, that's one one thing in this is like you commit and you think like you're done and you're never going to get decommitted and, and then it happens and then you don't know what to do. Yeah. Yeah. A hundred percent. Nobody ever thinks it's going to be them. And it doesn't mean that you have to, if they, if that's what motivates you, then great, go ahead. Like if your motivation is I'm not going to be the guy who gets decommitted, if that's what lights your fire, get after it. Um, but the reality is it's college baseball is hard. And if you're not willing to put in the work now, it only gets harder when you get to college. The margins are thinner. The competition is better. Failure is, is inevitable. Uh, if you don't want to put in the time and effort right now, college baseball is probably not ready for it. Probably, probably not the best place for you anyways. Um, and that's just the reality. So like kids who are committed right now, like you need to look yourself in the mirror. And you need to you need to have a heart to heart about how hard do I want to work to get this done? Am I willing to do the right stuff? Am I willing to make some sacrifices in my social life and off the field to make sure that I can achieve what I want to achieve in the four years that I'm on a college campus? Because you know as well as I do, most kids you're going to play four years if you're lucky, and your baseball career is done. What did you do when you were 17 and 18 to put yourself in a positive position, like? It's hard to wrap your head around now because when you're 17 and you committed to whatever, you know, big name school, you think you're going to play baseball until you're 40. And I get that. I'll never take away that dream from a kid. We're super positive when we talk about aspirations and goal setting and making sure that we're dangling a really valuable carrot on in front of a kid. But the reality is you do have to take a step back and realize that you don't have time to sit back and kind of go through the motions because you're going to get passed. Um, you're either going to get passed before you get to school or you're going to get passed when you get there. Um, either way, you're doing yourself a disservice if you're not willing to, to, to get in the gym, to get those extra swings in, uh, to do really well in the classroom, right? On top of just being a good person, being a good citizen, being a respectful person, a good teammate, good student, good son, um, 
that stuff matters too. Yeah, I think you nailed it. You know, there's this is. I think we pulled the veil back a little bit on the the the, the underbelly of college baseball recruiting. Um, you know, th- this is something that has been going on for a very long time. Um, you know, it's it's a little bit more out in the open because of social media and the like. And you know, there's <clears throat> there's a change coming because of the rosters and everything else. You're going to see a lot more over the course of the next couple of weeks. You know, but I, I would venture a guess to say that, you know, and look, this isn't going to be the case for everybody. Like you, you could be decommitted from a, a super high end SEC school and you could be really good. But the likelihood is that they have a lot of guys that they got out of the portal or Juco guys or other guys that they recruited that they feel are better than you right now. And they just don't have a roster spot for you doesn't necessarily mean that you're not a good baseball player. It just means that, you know, of the, they ranked their 34 guys and you were on the outside of it. And unfortunately that is something that's going to happen to a lot of players. Um, I shouldn't say a lot of players. It's going to happen to players over the course of the next couple of weeks. You know, it's not going to be, uh, you know, thousands, um, you know, but it, it'll certainly seem like there's a lot more over the course of the next couple of weeks than you've seen in, in recent years because of the roster crunch and, and everything else that's coming down the line, you know, but it's, it's ultimately making sure that you've been doing everything it is that you've needed to be doing over the course of the summer and the fall and being able to be, put yourself in position to be able to be recruited. And look, it, it might be hard for, you know, some, some arms, like you might be shut down, but if you got a, a, a plethora of video and you're able to kind of, piece together some highlight stuff and talk to some coaches. And, you know, at the end of the day, if you got decommitted from some, a good school, like the likelihood of you being able to pitch at a, a, maybe a mid major division one is, is probably pretty good, you know, and we've talked about this a lot. Like the, the fraternity of, of college baseball coaches is tight. You know, if you got decommitted somewhere and, you know, you were a great kid and it just came down to like, Hey, we just, we just don't have room for them and you're getting recruited by another school, like they likely know that coaching staff. They can shoot them a text or give them a call and be like, hey, what do you got? Like, hey, great kid, great family. You know, it's just super unfortunate. He, you know, we're going down to 34 and we just, we don't have a spot for him right now. Like, okay, like, but hey, like we think he's really good. We think he's good, just a tad bit short for us right now. And okay, Awesome. Like that, that feedback from that coaching staff to the, the, the one that could potentially be recruiting you could be the difference between you going further down the line with them or, you know, not. And, and that's okay. But, you know, I, I think, you know, the key to remember in all of this is like, this is going to be a gut punch if this is to happen to you and your family, but it's not the end of the world. You know, pull yourself up by your bootstraps. I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm pulling them out tonight. All of the, all of the anecdotes and, and, <laughs> one liners that I can think of, you know, and, and lay everything out on the table and start beating down some doors and, and see where you can go. Cause you know, yes, you have time from a mission standpoint, but you don't necessarily have a ton of time from a, a, a roster construction standpoint. You want to make sure that you, you can kind of get out and in front of some of these coaches, if you have the, the means to be able to do so, um, you know, and have, have your summer coaches or people like us call on your behalf and, and see what's up. Um, you know, it, it can lessen the burden a little bit more, if you have some people in your corner that that know some of the people you're reaching out to to uh, to help, and you know, it might be able to, it might be the difference between finding yourself a roster spot and you know, not necessarily feeling like you you're making the right decision um, and, and you're panicking. So, rule number one: don't panic. Don't panic, Coach Murphy. Well, I think you summed that up really well, Coach. I don't have anything else. Do you have anything else you want to add? I do not. All right. Well, thank you for listening, everybody. Tune in next week. We'll have another great topic to discuss. Talk to you then. Thanks, everybody. Thank you for listening this week. If you're watching on YouTube, go ahead and hit that subscribe button and smash that like button for us. Check us out on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, as well as Spotify. You can follow us on Twitter and Instagram at Baseball. If you want to find out what me and Keith do to help families and players navigate the recruiting process, 
go ahead and check us out on emdbaseball.com. Take a few minutes to check out our new online academy. I promise you'll get some good information out of that. Thanks again for listening. Check in with you next week.